Welcome back to the Shop Mini RC. I'm Ken, and this is Dinky RC. This is the Apex One V2 Pro Micro Experimental Class 124th Scale Crawler for the SEX24. <laughs> So if you remember, Dinky RC provided us some awesome parts for this all 3D printed, well, 95% 3D printed rig. These wheels, these are Dinky RC. Servo mount, Dinky RC. Upper links, Dinky RC. Rear truss, Dinky RC. Some very awesome stuff. These wheels are just sick. They're just, those are awesome, awesome wheels. And uh, this is gonna probably be just as awesome, if not more awesome. This is a tiny, tiny rig though. So we're gonna see what we can do about fitting all of the electronics we want in there. And uh, maybe we'll use this chameleon. I'm not sure. We got a chameleon set up here, so brushed. Or maybe, maybe this guy, right? Maybe. Or, or we can get crazy with it. I doubt this is going to fit, though. <laughs> I highly doubt it. It'll probably end up being this guy, but we'll see. We'll see what we can do. So the first thing we've got here, there's some Lexan panel, as well as some stickers look a little big for this but and then I think these are the uh, templates essentially for cutting out the Lexan panels again look how tiny they are this is a little guy it's 124th wheelbase but it is a little cage so um, we're super excited for what this guy's gonna turn out to be got ourselves a our hardware set we've got all kinds of awesome stuff in here let's pull it all out now this is essentially the ultimate combo kit he has uh, a baseline and an ultimate combo the baseline is $90 and the ultimate combo is $120. It is offered in a bunch of different colors. We got the dark gray, um, but it comes in black, gray, white, green, yellow, red, pink, and blue. Well, let's open up all this stuff that's in, in these baggies and lay it out so you can see what all comes in here. There's a skid plate, two servo mounts, a rear truss, two servo mounts because you might want to do four wheel steering. Dinky's got you covered. Got some stuff here. I'm not quite sure what this part's for. This looks like it's the head. This is a, a helmet, essentially. It's a two-piece 3D printed helmet. And it goes on this vacuum formed interior. Looks like we got some link parts here, some shock mounting parts. These are tiny. So here's some suspension links. They've got all the uh, pivots already in there, so that's pretty awesome the high clearance and our four links there there's our cage look at that that's the front bumper look how tiny the lights are oh it's so awesome so sweet i love the, the little ones i love 124th i just love it and when they're to scale it's just even better there's the actual rails and like i said the cage here so here's everything laid out with the ultimate combo. The ultimate combo includes the eight-piece links. Um, the baseline does not come with the links or the servo mounts. So it's more for people that want to use aftermarket parts or aluminum parts. Um, it does still come with the FLR skid. The FLR is pretty awesome. It allows you to mount your upper links and get a little bit better angle out of it. Um, so you've got a riser in there, which is awesome. The uh, Ultimate comes with both the front and the rear, so you can do four-wheel steering. And if you don't want to do four-wheel steering, you have just the single rear truss. So you can do both with this uh, when you get the Ultimate combo. Also, it comes with slightly shorter upper links. These are the 47.5 millimeter upper links, and it gives you better steering kingpin angle when you're using the uh, FLIR plate or the FLR uh, skid plate. That's the optimal kind of setup. The rest of the links are all 50 millimeter uppers and 58 millimeter lower links for the front and the rear. So the ultimate kit comes with kind of everything you need to build it in the most optimal fashion. The ultimate combo wheelbase is 143 millimeters, so 5.63 total wheelbase. The extra parts that you're gonna need um, beyond just the shocks, and I'll talk about those in a minute, uh, you're gonna need obviously a front and rear axle or two front axles, your transmission, your drive shaft, uh, all your electronics, motor ESC, servo, transmitter, a LiPo, uh, whatever LiPo you choose, but you want to make sure it fits. So there are, they're recommending like a 300 milliamp hour 2S, 
Uh, there's the Tattoo and the RDQ. It's basically a smaller battery. You can find the dimensions on the website. And then you're gonna need wheels and tires. Now, when it comes to the shocks, the ideal shocks are the telescoping shocks. They recommend the 39 millimeter to 43 millimeter telescoping shocks. So all the 3D printed parts like the cage are ABS 3D printed. It's um, a pretty resilient uh, material. So definitely good for durability and it's uh, resilient to UV light. So when you're running it outside, it doesn't get degraded. Uh, some 3D print materials will degrade as it's getting sunlight on it. And uh, that is not ideal if you run outside. So we definitely appreciate the ABS 3D printed. The interior portion of the chassis, this guy here, is a machined 1.6 millimeter Delrin. So this is kind of the backbone of it all. And this definitely adds to the rigidity and um, just kind of reinforcing durability, you know, cause you're gonna roll over, you're gonna have mishaps, you're gonna, you're gonna fall off some little cliffs and this will help reinforce everything. Delrin is super strong. So it's very forgiving. Also got our shock mounts here. Just wanna point that out. Other cage parts, the front with the bumper built in. You've got some spots for some three millimeter LEDs on the outside and then some super tiny ones if you want to put them on the inside there it's a one millimeter led those are not included obviously there's a rear tray which is a good place for all your electronics and then i believe this is kind of like a um another sort of tray uh or bracket that gives you additional mounting space above the transmission we'll know more as we get it together on where exactly that sits but i believe it sits on top of the transmission just kind of giving you an extra extra platform essentially all right, so we're going to start trying to assemble this guy, and uh, we may have some ups and downs. This is a unique kit, and it should go together fairly well. All the parts look very precise, very well you know, printed and machined, so I'm not really concerned about that. Um, my biggest concern is going to be fitting the electronics where we need them to be and just kind of tuning it, which isn't really a concern because you have to do that with almost every single build. So this should be a really cool build when we're done, but uh, let us get into it and... I'll update you as we go. And I just wanted to point out that both the baseline and the ultimate combo come with the interior, uh, the driver and the Lexan panels. This is styrene and then the Lexan panels and uh, mini sticker sheet and whatnot. So the first thing we've done is we went ahead and put our servo trays in. We're gonna go ahead and do four wheel steering. We're using some OGRC aluminum uh, axles. So we got that going. And then we put our rails on our skid. We're just kind of test fitting stuff as well. Stuff might have to come back apart to put things back together, but right now we're just kind of seeing how things go together. So we've got our rails together. And then uh, these, you can see there's some cutouts for your screw heads. They'll end up over the uh, rails like so. Just like that, pretty cool. The front end right here, this is a pivoting front piece, and it actually snaps down. The bumper here snaps down onto this mount. I don't know if you can see it very well. We've only got one screw in there right now. We are using two, one screw on each side, so that we like symmetry. You could just run one long screw through, but then you don't have a screw head on one side. It looks goofy. So we're using the M1.4s. They're all M1.4s, but these are the M1.4 uh, by five. So these are five millimeter, and that gives us the maximum amount of screw in that pivot. They should basically be touching right there in the middle. Um, you can use shorter ones, but then you know, you're know you kind of losing some strength. So we got that and it snaps down. You can see that. Pretty sweet. Uh, this is gonna be our battery tray, right? Mentioned it as a very small battery. You cannot use your stock SCX battery. It is just way too big, right? Even these little guys, these little guys might fit. Um, these are for drones, but again, there's a whole bunch of different batteries you can use. Uh, the small tattoos are ideal. So you might want to consider picking up some of that stuff. Uh, you can get your measurements, you can buy the rig, build it, get your measurements, and then you can also go out and find other batteries that fit that dimension. There's also some modifying you might be able to do, but I, I would not recommend that. It's pretty, uh, pretty on point how it's designed currently. So you don't want to mess with that. All right, let's keep uh, keep going. This this guy's actually gonna fit right in here, like so. Screws here, 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 and here. Okay. Now I want to point out while you're building this guy, you've got to be very careful because the screw holes on the Delrin are super tight. 
like, and they should be like they're they're basically thread you know you're threading as you screw in, which means if your holes are not aligned right, say your hole is just slightly off here right, and you're screwing it in. You need to watch to make sure it's not pushing through and pushing on the part you're trying to screw into. You also want to make sure it's as tight as you can up against the two pieces are basically sandwiched together as tight as possible, but at the same time making sure you do not push away as you're screwing in. Because if you do, you could end up cracking the Delrin, you could end up breaking the, uh, the mounting points. You just need to be careful. Again, this is 3D printed uh, and it is strong, but even, I mean, even with metal, I've seen it where there's threaded on both sides. And if you don't sandwich together, you have a gap. And if you're not careful also, and you keep screwing, you end up stripping the screw out or breaking the head off in the other piece. So just be aware of that kind of stuff. Don't over tighten any of this stuff. Going into plastic means it's much less likely to back out. You know, if you're going aluminum screws into aluminum, you, you want to lock tight it. And uh, if you don't, you can end up having screws back out. But when you're going into 3D printed material or Delrin material, the screw backing out is highly unlikely. So there is no need whatsoever to over tighten. You also want to use the longest screw without being too long, right? You can see we're just barely poking out with these screws. I'd rather have them just barely poking out than too short because the more that they're too short, you end up again, you having weak points there, right? You don't want to have weak points. You want to be reinforced with the screw as much as possible. So far, all these holes are like spot on perfect. So it's really well done. It's very precise in that regard. We haven't had to like drill out any holes. You know, make sure they're uh, big enough. Everything just seems to fit perfect. All right. So there's our front bit on. Okay. Our battery tray. I really like this uh, little clip design that he's got going on there. You can just open it up, pull your battery out. It's great. Let's keep on keeping on. I think we're going to look at what motors we can maybe fit in next. This tray goes in, I believe like so, let's see, it's kind of hard to tell, no, that's not right, ah, here we go, all the way to the back, so you basically mount it all the way to the rear, and then this bottom most, looks like it, yeah, the bottom most shock mounting position essentially, um, goes there, so actually, we can go ahead and put this part together, and then we'll kind of fiddle with the, uh, the motor, let's see what kind of motor we need to fit in there. And again, before I put this in there, I just wanted to point out, this is a scenario where you kind of want to use the longest possible screws on each side. Um, the screw kit does come with these guys. I'm not sure what length these are. Let's see. Looks like they're 10s or 12s. Mm, 11s? Either way, these are the longest screws that come with the kit. So we're going to use those in the rear here. And this, actually, you probably can't see. Oh, there you go. You can see it. It's completely... Uh, the hole goes completely through this. So if you had screws that you could run all the way to the middle, that would kind of be ideal, probably unnecessary, but it definitely helps reinforce that bit right there. All right, so we got a transmission in there. This is an AliExpress transmission. It's basically like the hot racing overdrive transmission. Let me pull this back out, I'll show you. It's got two gears in there with uh, different size gears, right? You probably can't tell, but this one's slightly smaller than that one, which means you can have overdrive in your front. So the front tires will spin a little bit faster than the rear and uh, basically helps you pull, pull you up hills and whatnot. So we're going to try this transmission out. We were thinking about trying to fit this guy in there, but we realized quickly that it's a rear mount or front mount. Sorry, the motor is front mount, right? Which means it goes right into your battery. So you can't do that. The Rocket Man, there's no way that's going to fit. That's just a huge, huge motor. That thing's ginormous, right? Like, <laughs> there's just no way. That's a monster truck motor. Um, and we knew those probably wouldn't fit. So we're gonna go ahead and try this chameleon here. Uh, see how big the chameleon is. It shouldn't be too big. I don't remember the exact size. But we got the ESC and the uh, motor itself. Got this on sale. It was a Black Friday sale. So we figured we'd pick one up and uh, probably be able to use it in a build. And of course, now we're gonna use it in a build. So this guy should fit. I don't see any reason why not. I think it's basically the same size as the stock motor, just longer. 
we got our ESC, Bluetooth. Where'd our transmission go? Yeah, I should be able to mount that guy right up in there. We have to swap our mounting plate, but that's fine. And then, yeah, this guy will just drop right in here. And we're good. Should be a perfect fit. Looks great. All right, let's go ahead and swap out our uh, motor plate here. Put in this sick carbon fiber one and uh, get the motor in. We'll be back. A few moments later. So one thing about these overdrive transmissions, uh, at least these ones from Ollie, they have slipper clutches in them. We've talked about this in other videos, but it's basically a little plate, like a kind of like a, a clutch or a brake, and it lets this spin freely, but it, when you're tied up against it, you still get enough grip, but it also means that if you end up binding or, you know, your drive, your motor's trying to spin it, but your uh, drive shafts are not spinning because your tires are stuck in a rock, this will actually spin, right? So it won't chip a tooth or break a drive shaft. The thing is, you've got to be very careful in how you tune this thing, how tight you make it and how loose you make it. Now you can just crank it all the way down, make it super tight, and it's basically like gluing a servo saver, right? Um, it just won't go anywhere. But if you back it off just a little bit, you give yourself just a little bit of slip. See that? I'm holding this, it's not spinning, but I can just, if I turn it, well, it's still a little tight, but there you go. Just kind of slip a little, let's loosen it just a little bit more. There you go. Now it's too loose, which means it's basically just gonna spin when I throttle it. And it's a very fine line. So with these, especially in crawlers, um, they're so small and usually you don't need um, the slipper anyway. So I just prefer to tighten them, have them a little more tight than a little too loose. Cause if they're too loose, it's a pain. You gotta open it all back up, tighten it down again. Um, and if they're too tight, it's just like every other SCX transmission. It's just a solid drive. But if you can get it tuned in there just right, you do give yourself just a little bit of protection. Now we gotta take this off because we gotta switch our plate, but I did wanna show you that. Also make sure when you put it back on, because this pinion or this uh, spur gear doesn't actually attach to the, uh, doesn't like have a slot in it to attach to the shaft. If you're not centered, you can have wobble if it's not, if your tolerances aren't tight enough. The, this one feels like it's pretty tight. So I feel like it's gonna be centered. You just don't want your uh, spur to be spinning and doing this because it's slightly off, you know, when you tighten it down. So just make sure you're straight when you do it. That's our rear clutch plate and then our two screws to pull off our motor mount plate. We'll be back when this is together. Now, one thing I do want to point out about this kind of transmission, if you are trying to reverse mount your motor, basically having your motor forward mounted, that means you're turning your transmission. And if the transmission is set to overdrive the front, now you're going to be overdriving the rear. So if you do plan on mounting this forward mount, you'll need to make sure you can get in here and swap the gears from this side to this side. You'll have to move this main gear over and then there's gears inside here. Let's see if I can open this up real quick. And those are also different sized. Those two little gears in there are different sized. So you need to see if you can swap them. Now, I don't even know if you can. Um, this shaft here looks like it's affixed to one of the gears. So you may not be able to. So just be aware if your plan is to run reverse mounted motor, overdrive transmission may not be ideal because you don't want to have your rear going faster than your fronts, essentially. That will not help you in crawling at all. Also, overdrive gears in the front, uh, having your front wheels spin a little bit faster than the rear, it helps your turn radius. Just of note. All right, we're gonna get this back together. All right, we got this guy in there. We went ahead and peeled off most of the sticker. Left this front piece on, because that's what'll show. Uh, I don't know if you'll really be able to see it, but whatever, we wanted to leave it there. Uh, but we peeled everything else off because when the motors get hot, that kind of keeps the heat in. So some say if you pull that off, it'll uh, help extend the life of your motor. We've got our mesh pretty good here. You can see it's just got a little bit of play, but everything moves nice and smooth. Okay. But you do want that little bit of play, just a little bit. So this should work well. Uh, we did have to Dremel, well, you can use an Exacto. We chose to use a Dremel. Dremel out the mounting point a little bit, not the hole, but just where the um, transmission sits in on each of these points, both here, here, where this third screw goes, and then a little bit right here, which had to clear out just a tiny bit. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily the, uh, the skid or this transmission. The tolerances were just a little bit off on one of them. Basically these, um, these mounting points 
and this screw, because it's a larger screw, uh, were just kind of hitting, and it wasn't fitting down in there as snug as I would have liked. I mean, it probably would have been fine, but we just wanted to make sure it was all the way down. It was all snug. There was nothing hanging up. The motor was completely, or the transmission was completely flat to the skid. And so now we are much, much better. Oh, the chameleon sticker does stick through just a little bit. Let's get our transmission in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That should be good. Yeah. <laughs> The chameleon will will show through a little bit and we're going to probably do red accents so we'll get red shocks and whatnot so that'll work well that looks awesome all right let's get our transmission cover back on and we'll mount it in there you know and since we're going to do red accents we've got a bunch of these uh red transmission covers so we're going to snag one of those see if it'll fit it should fit I like this ogrc one and we'll throw that on there Yeah, it gives a little extra red flare. So as I mentioned earlier, since we've never put one of these together and there's no actual instructions uh, on the website, you kind of just got to go by pictures. And there's, we figured we'd be taking things apart and putting it back together as we realize what we're doing. So this chassis, I just realized, these screws need to go through both the tube frame and the frame rails on the front and on the back. So we'll be pulling those screws back out and uh, putting them through the chassis itself, uh, you know, the tube chassis as well. So just little things like that, but that's to be expected. So not a big deal. Plus we're always trying to fit things and try things and see what works. And sometimes something doesn't work. So you gotta pull things back apart to make it work. Another thing that we found out, which is awesome. This is an FCX 24. So if you have an FCX 24, these batteries will fit. Look at this guy, bam, fits right in there. Perfect, and then when you get your rails on there, it is just fine in there. Seems to be anyway, for now, who knows? Maybe when we get more together, we'll need an even smaller battery, but I don't think so. I think this battery will fit just fine and uh, should work well. We're gonna go ahead and get our motor and transmission in and get these uh, tube chassis rails on there. We also got to figure out what uh, receiver we're going to want to use and how we're going to mount our electronics. More moments later. Now you've got to remember before you put your cage on with the front and rear screws, thinking you can just throw it on there, you're going to want to get your links in because your links are covered by the cage, right? So if you have links here, actually this upper link isn't, but if you were to use the lower links and definitely this rear link is covered by the chassis. Uh, the tube chassis so definitely make sure you get all of your links in before you put your chassis on another thing and i already mentioned this but i'm going to mention it again you've got to be very careful when you're screwing these in okay if you're screwing this in and it starts to push on your skid plates tab you know this mounting tab you need to back it out um this side went in just fine but this side i went ahead and i had some pliers and i held it with pliers tight so while I screwed it in to make sure it wasn't pushing out. For some reason, it seemed like it was aligning. I could see the screw aligned with the hole, but as I screwed it in, it was still pushing away from the chassis rail. So I don't want the skid plate ear and the chassis rail having any sort of spacing in there. It'll make my link not go in and could potentially cause breakage. So I just held it tight while I screwed it in. I've got the screw in and then I backed it out just enough so that I could fit my link in there. Okay. And then you can go ahead and go through. Just be careful again when it gets to the other side, this other ear, make sure you're not just pushing and separating because your screw's not in alignment with the hole. Be very careful with that. You'll easily break these things uh, or cause stripping if, if you're not careful. So I just wanted to point that out again. As you're installing your links, make sure that they're nice and loose on the ball joints. Uh, something we noticed here, you can see this link moves side to side very nicely, very loose. It'll just flop over right this one on the other hand kind of has some weird binding and i was like well what is going on here the ball joints feel very loose but it's still kind of binding and we noticed that it is barely just barely hitting on our transmission cover you can actually see on the link where it's kind of rubbing and it just 
kind of hits on the transmission cover just a little tiny bit. We're not really worried about this, but I just wanted to point that out. If you notice some sort of weird, you want to check the stuff as you're building. And if you notice something weird, you definitely want to investigate it because you don't want to get the whole thing together and then wonder why one side feels stiffer than the other on your suspension or something weird like that. And it all comes down to something you could have fixed while you were building or paid attention to. So really this, I, I think this is just going to wear in. It says the link is in. You can see it just kind of hits on the transmission cover just a little bit. And I'm not really worried about it as I just move it like this. It's starting to kind of already get a little bit of wear on there. And again, it'll, it'll break itself in essentially. You, I could go in there and try to just exacto this off or take a little sandpaper and sandpaper it down or even do it to the transmission cover because um, it's just kind of hitting on this chamfered edge right here. But I'm really not worried about it too much. Yeah, as I move it, it's, it's getting better. When I first put it in there, it was like kind of getting stuck real bad. So not real bad, but enough to where I noticed, right? Enough to point it out to you guys. So just kind of work it, or if you need to get in there and trim stuff. But again, the point is, as you're building, check all of your tolerances, check all of your links and your shocks and everything, and make sure stuff is moving nice and free because once it's together, it becomes a lot harder to diagnose. When you're screwing your tube chassis on, I would make sure that you don't screw them all the way in until you've got them all kind of in and connected. This back one's loose. It doesn't look loose, but it's not all the way tight. But it allows you to kind of just ever so slightly adjust it and move it and make sure your holes line up. This front piece is very thin. And if you are pulling on it, trying to, get, you know, you've got everything all screwed in and you're trying to pull on it or it's screwed in here first and you're pulling back, you could end up just, you know, cracking that piece. So I would just kind of slowly screw everything in. You can go all the way in and then just kind of back out a little bit and make sure that there's a little bit of play in this all before you do this front one at least. And then you can go ahead and... Notice how I had to back it. So when you screw them in, if they're not lining up, see that it's not really lining up and it's pushing away, back it out just a little until you can kind of feel the hole and then you can try to go back in. There we go. And then we're in the hole. You can go ahead and screw it in. We'll see it come through to this plate. You can try to drop it into the hole there. Make sure you're nice and tight as you go in. If you're not, you're going to want to back out just a little till you can get it flush again and then screw in again. And there we go. Nice and tight through three pieces that are all tight to the screw. You want to make sure it's nice and sandwiched all together before you continue screwing it in. Okay, again, we're not going to screw this all the way in yet. We're going to make sure we get our last screw in down here and get it going and make sure everything lines up and then we'll tighten them all down. I just wanted to show off our awesome little tool that we got. This little electric screwdriver, precise electric screwdriver, picked it up on Amazon. I got the link down in the description below. We don't use it really to put things together very often because there's no way to stop to have a torque setting so you don't know how tight it's gonna be. Sometimes we'll screw stuff in till about there and then we'll hand tighten it the rest of the way. But we like to hand tighten most of our stuff. Uh, but I do use it to pull screws out because it makes things way faster. And uh, yeah. Especially when you're doing like bead locks, this is great for putting screws into bead locks. Again, you just don't want to tighten it all the way down. You just want to get it almost, almost all the way and then hand tighten the rest of the way. But pulling screws out, taking things apart, this thing is a must. It's only like 20, 25 bucks. Anyway, it's awesome. Just wanted to show you. We're going to go ahead and put our uh, other side on. We've got this side all done. There's four main screw mounting points. Also, you can put a screw through up here and we're going to. Let me show you this. These little guys are your front shock towers. So they just drop into there. See that? Front shock tower just drops in. And then you can mount a shock here or you can mount it up, up in here, back here. I would recommend uh, putting a screw in regardless though. So if you've got your shock going through here, put a screw up in the front here. Uh, but it does give you extra shock mounting points. So that is nice. There's also these little guys included. I'm not 100% sure what they're for. It doesn't really mention it. I think they're kind of they're to be used as spacers. Or in one of the images on the, the website, they've got it on their servo horn. And I think it's kind of used as a nut for the uh, bolt on the end of your servo horn. If your uh, servo horn doesn't you know, hold the screw in very well, you can use one of these kind of as an end nut. Um, but I think also it's good to be used as a spacer 
if you need to space your shocks out. You get, let's see, six of these guys. So that gives you four for your shocks and then two more for, I guess, just other things you may need. Because it doesn't specifically show, again, where they are. The only place I actually saw them was on the servo horn. I couldn't really tell if it was being used on the shocks. I don't think it was. Maybe on the rears. But for some reason, your shock is hitting on your chassis or you just need a little bit extra space to get your shock alignment right. These would probably work well for that. If you know what these are for, well, let me know. But I think they're for spacing. I think they're for kind of a, a nut of sorts that won't back out uh, for your servo horn, that sort of stuff. Anyway, we're going to get this other side on. We need to get a longer screw in here, and then we'll put the rest of the cage on. I don't think we're going to actually put the, the, the rear and the top on yet because we need to access our electronics. And we need to get this guy in here, so we'll have to cut this guy out and get him in there. There is a mounting point for the chassis here onto the rail. So you can put a screw in here. Um, it is kind of at an awkward angle. Uh, the hole doesn't go through this side. This is for the body panels, these little holes here for the body panels. But it goes through the back side here. So just be aware, make sure you put that screw in there. It's gonna be a real short screw, just enough to get through the chassis rail and into the plastic. You don't wanna put a big long screw in there that pushes through or you know deforms the uh, tube chassis portion. Other than that, that's, uh, that's it for mounting points here, here here, 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 and then up here. And then you've got your roof and back piece, the back piece as well. Now, before we put our other side of the tube chassis together, we're gonna look at our electronics. We're gonna figure out how we wanna mount stuff. I think we're gonna end up mounting this uh, ESC on the little floating tab here. So we'll run it like this. We're gonna probably resolder all these wires. We're gonna just run a short wire from the motor to the ESC. It'll be a little guy there and um, we may shorten up our battery lead quite a bit. We want it to be real clean in there. And then uh, we gotta figure out what we're gonna do for a receiver. I don't know if we're gonna use a stock receiver or if I've got another one laying around. I gotta find a receiver to use. So we'll figure that out. Uh, but we're definitely gonna shorten up all these wires. We'll probably bring this wire back quite a bit. Um, and that'll, that'll be nice there. Uh, brings our wires, our battery leads towards the battery, our motor leads on the back towards the motor, and it gives us our switch right here on the, on the side. So that is, uh, probably where that's going to go and then we'll just put our receiver in the back and we'll even keep the bluetooth module on there so it should be pretty uh pretty clean not much to it definitely digging this chassis man all the tolerances on all these holes are so good like i didn't really have to align much or i haven't re-drilled any holes at all nothing the only thing we found so far was this one link on the motor plate and it again it's it's nothing that's that's a that's a nothing there because it's moving nice and smooth now um so really, everything has been just perfect. The only thing I wish we had were better build instructions, but that's what this video is for, to help you build yours. This is really a builder's kit. You know, it's really meant for somebody who wants to get in there that it's not your, definitely not for your first build. You don't want to do this for your first SEX 24 build or micro build, because um, you kind of got to have a little bit of knowledge. I and mean, you probably could, especially if you've built other RCs before, um, but I would call this an intermediate to advanced build. You know, definitely need to know what you're doing a little bit here. Um, it is a little, you know, it's a premium premium kit, so you, you don't want to end up breaking things or, you know, cracking any of the prints or the, the chassis rails or anything like that. So anyway, we're going to get this guy together and keep going. So we found a receiver we're going to use. This is for our Flysky Noble. Um, I don't really want to decase it, and it does sit a little tall, so I think what we're actually going to do is we're going to put the receiver here. That way it sits better underneath our driver. And then we're going to put our ESC here in the back. Um, I'm probably just going to unsolder these. Well, let's go ahead and do it now. We're going to unsolder these two wires, and then I'm going to snip these here. So that way we still have a good plug with some decent wire on it if we want to use it later. And we're just going to solder these wires directly to the board. These wires aren't labeled, and when you unsolder these, you need to make sure you're soldering your positive to your positive, your negative to your negative, or you're going to fry some stuff. And we don't want to be frying things. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to mark our positive with our silver pen. So we know this is, we'll just put a little plus on there, positive. Now we know that that is the positive side once we unsolder. Okay, so we're gonna get this done. We'll show you what we got when we're done. A little longer than a few minutes later. So it's looking like we're gonna mount it something like this. However, we do have a small problem. Our receiver is pretty large. This is really designed for like a micro receiver almost something like this. So low profile that is. Um, we might have to decase this. 
we were able to, the nice thing about this uh, little platform here is it's pretty bendy, right? It seems like it flexes quite a bit, which is nice. I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of hard to see, but like, uh, here, see that. As long as you're not hitting your drive shaft, you should be fine. Um, the concern is trying to get the body on here or the interior. The receiver doesn't really center very well or fit into the, the driver's you know body or head. So really it's just kind of pushing down on the little mounting platform and trying to get it to fit with the driver and interior. I did keep more of this interior than you're supposed to. I kind of wanted the back covered a little bit, so I left that. You're supposed to cut it all the way to the back of the driver, but I did want it cut there. I notched it out. You can see there's some notches in there, notches here on the side. I think it's a little bit cleaner look, um, but I just can't get it low enough. I mean, when you push down hard, it ends up hitting the drive shaft. See that? So I think we're going to have to decase to get our body on. Um, we might also trim this back a little bit more so that we can get our battery in and out easily. Again, this battery is like the top of the top. When it comes to size, you really can't... Really, you should probably get something smaller, but we're just trying to work with what we've got. It does fit, and then we can plug it in here on the side and tuck our, uh, our balance cable in once we have our other rails on, you know. Um, so that should be fine. Once this interior is kind of mounted in here though, I don't know how easily, oh, that's not too bad. Um, yeah, that should actually work just fine. So I'm not really worried about the battery yet. <laughs> just this guy here. So I think we're gonna decase it, try to get a little more space. Uh, it's not ideal, I really don't wanna decase, but it looks like we probably have to. Um, you definitely need small electronics for this uh, setup. You can't be using big stuff at all. And this isn't even really that big, but like I said, ideally you'd be using a micro receiver. Actually, we got this guy here. We don't, I mean, this came with the GL that we bought, but look how small this guy is. You're using different uh, connectors as well, but that guy is very small. And that's kind of what you're looking for is this size receiver. They use them a lot in the 128th uh, on-road and drift cars. Uh, I actually have my monster truck using one of these and a couple other, not this one specifically, but the Noble uh, Mini. And uh, I think one of the other crawlers as well. So they're pretty small. They definitely fit better in a build like this. So I don't know. Maybe I'll maybe I'll pull out one of the other ones. I don't know. I don't really want to switch my plugs because you do have to switch over to these smaller servo plugs. So we'll just we'll decase this and see if we can get it to fit. More moments later. All right. We went ahead and moved the battery wire to this side. It's a little bit longer. We got a little bit more space to tuck it down in. Um, and then we just want to be able to make sure we can plug and unplug our battery since we're not going to really have access to the switch. I mean, we could. Here, let's, let's check it out. So we can pull our interior in and out. I'm not going to permanently mount it. It's going to hold in just fine, just from the pressure. And uh, once the roof's on there, there's no way it's coming out. So I do like leaving these little extra tabs in the rear and covering the back. It helps hold it down. Oh yeah, we can see our switch. Sweet. Perfect. And actually, you didn't have, don't even have to use a tool. I was thinking, well, worst case, we could use a tool. But uh, we don't have to. I can reach it with my hand. Perfect. That's awesome. I'm excited for that. And you tuck this guy down in there. Should be good. We just got to make sure he's got some head clearance here. And it is very tight, but he's touching a little bit. But that's okay. Once we screw it down in there, it'll be nice and tight in there which uh, I prefer. Worst case, we could just take a little bit out the top, but I'm not going to. I think it's fine. Um, even when I push down, you can see here where ESC is mounted now. We have plenty of room still. And when I push down, you can see it. it's got it's got a little bit of, a little bit of room in there, um, but it's definitely not going to hit the drive shaft. Very clean. I feel like if you've got the right electronic components to fit in there, this, this build, everything is nice and tight and the weight proportions, I mean, your battery's right up front. Super good, super, super good. I'm really digging the design of this thing. Yeah, yeah, this is gonna look clean, clean, clean. Awesome. Like I said, once he's, he's uh, the roof's on there, he's gonna be in there pretty tight. It's not gonna pop out. Sweet, all right. Really, that's all we got left is the roof, and then we can do our axles and servos and stuff. Um, I'm not going to mount the roof and the guy in there until we get all of our servos plugged in. 
got to get our axles and servos on. So we'll do that next. I also figured I'd show you how I do my wires. If I'm not going to cut them or put new ends on them and shorten them up, I'll just usually twist them like this. And that shortens them up quite a bit. And if I need to go even further, if it starts to do that, right, where it twists onto itself, that's kind of the max you want to really twist it. And then what I'll do is I'll do a wrap, basically a pigtail style, right, where you take it and you pigtail it. You want to make sure you keep it twisted as you go, because if you start to untwist it, see that? It'll get kind of goofy. So I'm twisting it as I wrap it, just to make sure it stays nice and twisted. See, and you can see when you're doing it right, there's a pattern. I kind of messed up in the beginning here. Let's undo that part, actually. Let's see if I can get it fixed. Just want to make sure there's no like bumps in it. And also try not to twist it too much at the ends um, because that's where you will get breakage. All right, so that should be enough. That's, that's plenty really. And that gives you kind of a, a little bit of a pigtail going on and it's twisted. I did it here on this yellow one. It came out really well. That's a stiffer wire though. If your wires aren't stiff, sometimes they don't hold the shape very well. Um, the ideal solution is to just cut them and shorten your wires to the proper size. But we are not trying to do that right now. So we'll just do it like so. I realize why my pattern got all screwed up. It's because this is two different diameters. So we just use this smaller screwdriver and you can see as you wrap it around, you get a nice little pattern. Or at least close to it. Sometimes it'll, you know, depending on the diameter, it could change a little bit. But you can see there's some consistency there. And just kind of keep twisting it onto itself and tighten it and tighten it. Again, you don't want to pull on these sides here or these sides down in here um, but in this area here you should be fine and i've even before gone so far as to kind of heat it up like it's like a blow dryer heat gun or whatever and just kind of heat the wires just a little bit while they're twisted and then they hold their shape a lot better okay end up with something like that all right we got our front and rear axles on we got our servos on our electronics are pretty well laid out we're hooked up to our noble right now we got our front servo working seems good we got the three flow nine roller bearing links on the front uh, just some regular links on the back those are hooked up to our our little roll switch over here for now we'll probably mess with mixing and whatnot later and throttle just gotta get some drive shafts some shocks and then throw our interior in and our roof wheels and tires we're good to go it's a pretty fun little build guys i'll be honest got our interior in everything's fitting nice and snug in here we got some shocks on here now these are the enjora oil filled uh they're 39 millimeter the dinky website recommends 39 to 43 now, one thing we've noticed with these shocks, there's kind of some issues going on, and uh, I don't know if we're missing something and how we're supposed to be laying this out or not, but let me just kind of walk through the shocks, because I think the shocks are kind of a tricky part of this build. Now, we do have these guys. They're the 43 millimeter double barrel or telescoping shocks. When they say 39 millimeter shocks, I believe they also mean telescoping shocks. So maybe there's something with the telescoping shocks that'll work better, but we wanted to try the oil filled at first. However, if you notice here, these are, I had to put a spacer in there. I used one of these little guys here. And we use these as spacers for the front here. You could also use a nut on the back. You can see we used one of the nuts. It's actually like an M2 nut. So it doesn't actually thread in. It just is kind of used as a spacer because we have a bunch of those. And, but we had to space it out because the shock was hitting on the chassis. And you can even see, look at our lower mounts. I mean, we're not even screwed all the way in. If we screw all the way in, let me show you what happens. Look at how angled these shocks get. And they, uh, they definitely bind. I mean, they bind bad. So we're probably, regardless of whether we use these 39 oil fields or these 43 double barrels, my guess is, in the picture they mount up here, but my guess is that we're gonna have to put a small amount of spacer in here, make sure we're not hitting our knuckle. And uh, yeah, we'll just have to get a space because this angle right here, the shocks are like this. 
don't know if you can see it very well on camera, but they are pretty leaned outward towards the top, which is definitely not ideal. Um, it's not the worst, but it's just, you, you, again, you want your shocks to be fairly, fairly vertical here, right? These aren't binding actually as bad as they were earlier. I wonder what was causing that. Maybe because our collar was all the way up. Yeah, maybe it's because the collar was all the way up and it was rubbing or something. Either way, it does hit on the chassis quite quite a bit because of the angle they're at. So if it would have been nice if Dinky was able to cut this in just a little bit, angle this a little, little more in some way, narrow the front end. You got plenty of room right here in the front, right? There's plenty of room. You could have taken a millimeter or two out of the front uh, to narrow the whole front end a little bit. However, then your frame rails are not exactly sh you know straight because these frame rails are equal distance parallel the whole way so you'd have to do something with the frame rails to have them kind of go in which is not ideal and i understand that so there's design limitations there without really over complicating things um but at least on this tube chassis doing something to try to uh get these shock mounting points now these would probably be perfect for fcx axles because the fcx axles they mount pretty far out so you would have a lot more shock space on the bottom they'd probably be more like this with the fcx axles Anyway, the rear does the same, but it's not nearly as bad, right? The rear uh, mounts straight to the chassis rails, so that Delrin chassis rail, and it doesn't angle nearly as much. But you can see those fronts, they angle quite a bit. And I can just measure it real quick to show you. So the top screwed head to screw head is 60, and the bottom screw head to screw head is 53 make sure yeah 53 so 60 to 50 so there's a seven millimeter difference between the top and the bottom and i can't really tell from the pictures if he's doing something different or i don't know if we move the shocks up here when we, we'll put these on and we'll check it out but when we move these shocks up here it'll probably help quite a bit but then why have all these shock mounting points here? I don't even know how you would remotely use this rear shock mounting point here. You'd have to have a huge spacer and uh, to, make sure, to make sure you're not rubbing. And then you'd really be angled. So maybe that's for like Super 8s or FCX axles if somebody wanted to run those. Because again, those would be perfect. I'm going to go ahead and make sure I've got these mounted all the way in with no space. Because we, we did back them out to have a little space to see if the binding helped. Um, All right, so let's measure this as well. So again, the front, we were at 60, is that right? Yep, 60. The rear drops it in quite a bit down to 56. 56 and a half, really. And again, with the bottom being probably 53 again. So that's a three millimeter difference. 54. No, sorry, 50, yeah, 55. Let's measure this one again. Maybe this is 55. Oh yeah, we were just, uh, we were off a little bit. So yeah, 55 on that as well. Uh, so there are 55 on the bottom, 60 on the top front, and 56 on the back, on the top, 57 almost. So two millimeter difference between the top and the bottom on the rear, and a huge, five millimeter difference on the front. So the front's a little like three wider, realistically. And that's because again, the shock mounting points are not directly on the Lexan. And even if you were to try to do that, your shock would hit so bad. You almost have to like take out this entire tube chassis part to be able to uh, make sure you're not hidden. So again, I don't know if he did something on the front on that, you know, on the Dinky website, they don't show, but maybe there's spacers here. Maybe, who knows, who knows? So another issue that we had, I'm kind of rambling here, sorry guys. Another issue we had, and we use these tiny little guys here. So these are RC all-wheel drive, like the super high-end ones. We've had them for a while. We don't run them on anything. They don't even use hexes, uh, but they sit right on the pins, and they're tiny, and we're not going to run these. They do kind of look a little goofy because they're such small. Oh, we can't drop it in, but they're so small, right? Like, it doesn't look horrible. I mean, some might think it's cool looking, like kind of sand rail-like, <clears throat> but... Even with these small, super small diameter tires, these guys are 40, 48 millimeters, you know, 1.8, 1.9. 
inch tires, they would hit, right? You would rub real bad. So putting on something like this, which is kind of what we actually want to run, is bad news, right? Like there's no way. Bad news, no way. And again, these are huge. I get that, I get that. Um, you can run some stocks, but even the stocks, you're rubbing. So I'm pretty confident in saying that this kit requires some extended axles, some plus fours. So we went ahead and we've got plus fours on here. We haven't done this one yet, uh, just because I wanted to kind of show the difference in what the plus four would offer, right? So you're hitting there, but this gives you quite a bit more space. So I'm pretty confident to say you need plus fours on this guy. Um, we're going to be using the Deluxe Fab CVDs on here. And then actually we've got, uh, where'd they go? We've got some brass knuckles. We're going to throw some brass knuckles on here. These are aluminum, but we're going to put brass in the front just to kind of give us a little bit more front weight bias. And we're going to throw these telescoping shocks on. And then we've got some paddy weights for the front. So we're going to have brass knuckles, brass paddy weights, and brass hexes all on Deluxe Fab plus fours. And then the rear is going to be running just the aluminums with aluminum spacers and brass hex. So that's what we're going to look like there. Okay, and that'll give us a little bit more front weight bias. And I am going to try to run these. Uh, these are actually Max Smasher monster truck tires. They're a lot. These are the thinnest monster truck tires out there. Um, but I do like kind of the diameter. I think they look really cool in here. They're not the best compound when it comes to crawling, but kind of like rock bouncing and whatnot. I mean, I think that's pretty nifty looking. So we're going to try those. Again, we can always swap out wheels and tires easily, so I'm not too concerned, and you shouldn't be too concerned with what wheels and tires we're using. Uh, there are a ton out there, and they're very personal preference, but you need plus fours, and we're going to mess with these shocks, and we'll come back. So I do think these double barrels definitely help um, with the clearance or the angle. It's probably why they're recommended. Um, we are going to have to still put some space in there. Hopefully they won't bind once we get a little bit of spacing in there. Another thing is if you've got these fake reservoirs, you're going to be hitting on the, uh, the chassis unless you flip them to the other side and that's just kind of goofy looking. So we're going to take the shock housings off these injuras here that have no, uh, no fake reservoir. And we're going to use those instead. Plus I like the red. It'll be red on the top. So that'll look cool. Bummer. It looks like the uh, Injora oil fields have a different diameter shock housing than these guys. It's much larger and it actually is even larger than the regular Injora non oil fields. So it looks like the oil fields have a just larger diameter shock housing, probably because it helps with the oil, right? Like you want to be able to have a little bit more flow through there so they're not binding up in the oil. Um, so that makes sense. We just weren't really expecting that. So we can't swap these out. We may have to just drum them off. Maybe we'll just drum off these fake shock housing or fake uh, reservoirs. We have these other injurers, but they also have fake reservoirs on them. I don't know if we have any without fake reservoirs right now. So that's fine. We'll just drum these guys off, at least in the fronts. So maybe we'll leave the backs, but we're going to take off the fronts. Bam, there you go. Just like new. So that works out. We just sharpened it up a little bit. It's better than some silver and black. So we also sanded it just a little bit just to try to get some of the, this uh, dremel bit is very coarse. So we want to smooth it out a little bit. So we use some fine, fine uh, grit sandpaper and colored it in. Seems fine to me. All right. Now we should be able to mount these up in here and not have that shock reservoir hidden on our chassis. So I wanted to show this as well. We are going to try putting both of our O-rings on the inside. This is the part that mounts on the axle here. So here I can show you on this one. So we, because our top is wider than the axle, we want to push this out as far as we can without hitting our knuckle. You don't want to hit on the knuckle. Um, but we're basically right now with this one, we've got a o-ring on the inside and the outside. Some people will remove one of those o-rings to help prevent binding. 
Um, one thing of note, when you do that, you create slop, right? The front end will shake. You have a lot of slop. Same with like your links. If you remove O-rings, and you can see here, we're not running any O-rings in these. These are 3D printed and that's how they came though. But there's no O-rings and there's just a tiny bit of slop, which is okay sometimes. Um, but if you have that in every joint, you know, your links, your, upper, your lower links, your upper links, and your shocks, you can end up with a lot of slop. So you want to just kind of O-ring enough to where that slop is minimalized, but you're not, you're not getting binding. Now, one thing that we're going to try, which I haven't actually ever done before, is put both O-rings on the inside here, which means we've got our larger uh, diameter on the outside from the uh, pivot ball. And we're going to go like this and mount it like so. And what that's going to do is that's going to push our shock to the outside of the pivot ball and not have um, too much slot because we've got two O-rings. If we were to just put the one O-ring on the inside, that might work as well, but then you've got a lot more side-to-side -side slop in there. And we don't want a whole bunch of side-to-side -side slop. You can see we've still got good movement, right? There's no binding. There's a little bit of play in there, nothing too crazy, um, and that's with two O-rings. So if we had just one O-ring, you'd have a lot of slop in there. So we're going to remove uh, the outside, put it on the inside, and put it out here. Again, that's going to move our shock outward a little bit, which should hopefully prevent some of the binding in the shock shaft itself uh, from the angle issue that we're having. I think on the upper mounts, we're just going to use one O-ring on the inside, which honestly, I don't even know if we need the O-ring in there at all because this guy is going to be pretty much hitting on the chassis no matter what, unless we put a lot of space in there. So we'll just leave the one O-ring for now. Uh, we may adjust that later. We'll see. And that O-ring down here, I don't know if you can see it, this side has it, this side does not. Um, it moves it out about a half a millimeter, you know, so just, just a tad, just a little bit, but it should help a little. Again, we're trying to align this so that it's vertical. Alrighty guys, so we've got the two O-rings on the inside on the bottoms, and then we've got a spacer. We use those little, uh, little spacers that we aren't sure what they're for. You can see them right here. Right, it's that little spacer right there to kind of space out the tops. Still has a little bit of a an angle outward, you know, just a little bit of out, but not too much. And um, we put the O-rings on the inside and the outside here. We had it with just the inside, but there was just too much slot. They were just sliding way too much, so we went in and put the O-rings on the inside and outside up there. That also helps kind of tuck the the shock inward. And we might even be able to move the O-ring from the inside to the outside to bring the shock in a little more since we have such a spacer there. But for now, this seems really good. So we're just going to keep it like this. We've got some droop. We can probably go with some softer springs um, so that it droops just a little bit more. But we've got just enough spring and just enough droop. You can see when you pick it up, this is what your droop is, right? So when it's sitting naturally, and then that is droop. That's how low it droops. And uh, softer spring would allow this to sit a little lower which means our ride height would be just a little lower, and then we'd have more droop. And all the uh, articulation seems good. There's very little binding, so that's good. And these are cheapy shocks. These are just the basically the cheapest double barrels I could find, and they seem to work just great. Again, it's all about, almost all the double barrels are the same anyway. Um, so it's really just about making sure you've got your angles correct, setting up your, your O-rings and your spacing and all that kind of stuff uh, to really make it perform and not bind up. If you're binding, it's because you're not set up right, like 99% of the time. There are some that are, you know, some double barrel shocks that are just not, they don't seem very good, or maybe it's bad manufacturing tolerances, or maybe you got unlucky, but this seems great. And again, we got plenty of, it's kind of hard to show here, but plenty of articulation side to side. Okay. And it's not binding at all. Super smooth. So that's good. I was really worried. So I'd highly recommend with this kit, the double barrels. You, you've got to run it. You can't really run the oil fields. Um, you, you probably could if you changed up the, the axle to like an FCX, a wider axle, and that way you could kind of have a better mounting, you know, an angle. But even then you're going to be kind of shorter, but then you can use the lower shock mount. So if you want to use oil fields, you need to use some different axles that are a little wider. Um, we're going to go ahead and work on the backs now. And the backs are going to be much easier because again, they just... They've got, they're not as wide at the top. And so, yeah, it should be much easier. Okay, so here we are. The backs were very easy, like I said. We just put the O-rings on the inside and the outside on both the bottom and top. And we have just a, like a wheel nut spacer, basically one of these little M2 nuts. And we're just using that as a spacer. We, we could have used one of these guys too, probably. Um, I think they're probably the same as far as width is concerned. Let's look. Looks like we're at, 2.9 on the 3D printed spacer or nut. 2.9, almost 3. And then this guy is 2.9. 2.93. And do it again. 
basically 2.98. So they're the same width. So it doesn't really matter which one you use. Um, these also can be used as your nuts for the back, right? So if you put your screw through on your shock and you find that it's not holding in the Delrin well, and really this isn't very thick and it's not threaded, so you're probably gonna have to end up putting a nut on the back or something like one of these guys to help kind of tighten it up into there. So just be aware, that's what these are realistically for. And like I said, also the servos, if your servo is loose, because uh, the hole on your servo horn is too big. You can use these guys as nuts. Here, I'm gonna throw this on. And there you have it. So those will work on the shock mounting points in the back as well, especially if you're going through only the Delrin on the rear. The fronts go through not only the shock mount here that's in the tube chassis, but also the Delrin, and then also the other shock mounting point. Um, if you're doing it through the top holes here, you have like three layers that you're going through. So you can use a pretty long screw there, and it'll definitely hold without something backing it. But on the rears, again, it's just the Delrin, so you may need something in there if you find those coming loose. Now, back to our shocks. You can see we've got our back done. And we've got some good droop there. It's about half droop, maybe a little less. Maybe we're only going about a third down. But you can, again, put softer shocks on and then adjust your preload. But our uh, articulation and everything is, is great. There's no binding. We're fairly vertical there, so that's good. The only issue that we found is because of our motor. So you can see here, we're using the longer motor. This is that Furitec Chameleon, and it's hitting on our upper link just a little bit. You can see it right there. The link is just barely hitting. Now it's not bad. Basically, it hits at that point right there. We could have it, you know, compress all the way to the chassis if that motor, if we were using a short or stock motor. Um, you can see that on this side. Basically, if I force it, we'll compress all the way to the servo. But this side cannot. Now that's not a big deal. If you were really worried about that, you could take a Dremel to the back of the motor and just try to Dremel off a little bit. There's a little bit of space in there on just the housing. Not much, but you could take out a little bit right there on the housing of the motor. You could also try to notch out your link just a tad, but just know when you notch out your link, you're gonna be um, definitely weakening it. You could also try to put shims underneath your transmission and raise your transmission up just a tad. That would also help, uh, but then you're also gonna lessen your clearance underneath your body here and change your drive shaft angles just a little but if you were to shim up this a little bit take just a little bit of sanding and take out just a tiny bit there and then dremel just a little bit off the back of the motor you could probably get it compress get it to compress all the way um just like the the other side here but again we're not worried about it that is plenty so totally fine there and uh yeah we're going to do our drive shafts now uh, we wanted to get the shocks all set up and understand our full range of motion before we decided on the, how we're going to do our uh, drive shafts. We ended up going with some more OGRCs lately. I've just been buying the Gladiator drive shafts for like everything. Every time I buy the drive shafts, it's basically the Gladiator because the front works on just about everything as far as the C10 is concerned, the Bronco, all that. That works fine. Um, and then if you need something longer, you've got the Gladiator drive shaft length. And you can always cut this down. It is aluminum, so it does take a little bit of work to cut it down. Um, it is strong aluminum for sure and gets real hot, but you can chop this guy down to the length you need and you know, you've, you've always got the option on how short you need to go, especially when you're doing custom lengths, right? And if you want, you can use plastic. We've got plastic, you know, gladiator drive shafts, but even if we were gonna buy new plastic drive shafts, we would get the gladiators again, just because we like the extra length and we can always cut them down. So we're gonna do our drive shaft by basically just measuring out our compressed length. So we'll compress, and that's gonna be basically the minimum we need. And you go, I'm gonna go from basically hole to hole. That's kind of how I do it. And this is just doesn't have to be perfect. You just don't wanna have the drive shaft slipping out. So looks like we're at 48.9 or yeah, 49, 49 hole to hole. So then we can take this guy here, make sure that 49 hole to hole, it'll compress all the way. And yeah, we're fine. So if we were to go back to 49, sorry. Here's our 49. This front drive shaft should work just fine there. Okay. And then as far as max, you can always measure your max as well. So that would be our 49, right? That's our most compressed point. And then that's as max as we're gonna go is that far. So let's measure out our full down, fully extended. And it's not much more. Looks like it's just right at 50. I can't get those in there, but yeah. 
right there at 50. So it's just going to be like a little bit extra. So we have plenty of range of motion there. Um, and we're not cutting it, so we're not really too worried about it. We can just go ahead and also test fit it this way. Just throw that in there. Throw this guy in there. And we're fine. Again, there's not a lot of, you can see, it doesn't compress too much. So the amount of movement uh, in the drive shaft is minimal here. The more travel you have, obviously, the more it's going to uh, you know, slide in and out of your drive shaft. Also, make sure your drive shafts are in phase. Let me show you that real quick. It's basically lining up your tabs here, right? This tab goes from here to here. You could have it like this, and that would be out of phase, right? Your tab goes from here, and then it's on the side. So just always make sure your tabs are the same. Um, on a lot of drive shafts, too, you can just line up your screws, your screw holes. So there's a screw hole, there's a screw hole, they're on the same side, we're good. If you were to have it like this, you have one screw hole there and one screw hole there. That's not in phase. Having it in phase it helps prevent vibration at high speeds. Simple as that. We're gonna go ahead and do the rear as well with the gladiator drive shaft. We're definitely gonna have to cut it down. So we're gonna go ahead and measure it, cut it, and then get it in there. Now, if you haven't done this before, make sure you don't cut off too much. You'd rather, you'd rather cut it like say here, and then uh, find out that you're hitting when you compress, and then you can always trim it down and go further and further and further. If you cut it too short and your drive shaft pops out, there's no adding back. So always make sure you cut less. You can always go more later. So we went ahead and measured here, and it was about 54 millimeters. Our total length is 69 and a half. So we need to cut off basically 15 and a half. So we're gonna do 16, I guess, 16 millimeters. Um, and then we'll see where we're at. Hopefully we'll be able to compress all the way. Again, if not, we can take off a little more. If you really wanted to err, you would just take off the 15 if you want to err on the side of caution, and then you can take off the extra half millimeter if you found yourself uh, still kind of hitting when you compress. So we're basically going to take off about this much, um, 15 and a half millimeters right to the logo, and uh, yeah, we'll see where we're at. So we just used our cutting wheel to chop it down. Now we're going to clean up the ends because it's a little, little sharp, a little burry, and we'll just use our barrel sander for that. And then we're just going to sand it down a little bit so we don't have those uh, sanding lines from the coarse barrel sander. Let's go ahead and measure it out. We're at 40. And the whole thing is 53.6. What did we measure here? I think we measured like 55 to the max. Yeah, 55, hole to hole is like 50, mm, it's hard to get in there, but looks like it's 53, 50, yeah, 53 hole to hole. So hole to hole here, we're at 52, which means there should be a little bit of a gap there, which is what you want. Let's go ahead and put it in and see. So another little thing of note when it comes to drive shafts, generally speaking, you want to put the barrel end or the female end of the drive shaft at the transmission, and then the male end or shaft end at your axle. The reason for that is, at least on bigger scales, especially on the, you know, on one tenths and just larger scales that I guess the philosophy or the theory is that when you have your uh, barrel end at the transmission, it sits higher, right? So you're sitting like this and it points downward and that prevents dirt and stuff from getting up in there. If you had it down at the bottom, you could argue, you know, if this is at the bottom pointing up, you could argue that dirt and whatnot could get down in there. So having it like this with the shaft end at the axle means that you're less likely to get dirt and grime up in there and cause, you know, binding. So just another little tip. So once you dremel it down, just make sure you get nice and smooth movement in there. There's no burrs or anything causing it to scratch or feel like it's tight. It should be nice and loose. And then we can throw this guy on here. All right, so we're all the way on and it looks like we have plenty of space for full compression. Enough that it's falling off, so we're good. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and sand this down a little bit more, just a little and then we're going to color it with a black sharpie so it doesn't look like it's half done. Now to get our screw into our drive shaft on this end, you can't really get it this way because the plate or the you know, skid plate's in the way, so you got to come in from the side. So we're going to come in opposite the motor and you can access the hole for your drive shaft. And there we have her. Drive shafts look good. No binding. Everything feels nice and loose. We've got a good amount of shock, good amount of droop. Seems good. Now we just need to get some wheels and tires on her. And hopefully we're not hitting too much when we turn. Otherwise we're gonna have a bad turn radius. Um, which isn't the worst because we have four wheel steering, but you know, ideally you want maximum steering angle. 
always, but if we're hitting, we'll have to reduce it just a little bit in our endpoints, but that's okay. So let's just check everything, make sure everything's running like it should. Seems like we're gonna have some pretty decent slow crawl. High speed isn't too crazy, but again, it's supposed to be a crawler. We're not really doing a rock bouncer per se here. It's kind of rock bouncer I guess, but we'll see how fast it is. We're staying rushed, so we've got our steering. Seems good, rear steer. And we're just kind of doing that on an adjustable channel here. And we can adjust how fast it turns, how many steps as we turn this, and there's little clicks in there, click, 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 click. So we can adjust how far it turns on each click or how granular it is. So that'll be cool. But yeah, overall, seems like it could be good. All right, let's get some wheels and tires on. So another thing I'd like to do when I'm putting on wheels and tires, especially new ones and these brass, and especially when you're using pancake weights like this, you need to check and see your tolerances and how tight things fit when you bolt down and tighten down your nut. Um, you can put this guy on here, tighten it down, and you'll feel that there's a little bit of binding. These need to be super loose back and forth. If it's too tight and it feels like you have to actually give force, you can almost blow on the wheel and it should move like that, right? But if it doesn't, then you're too tight and you need to back it off. Now, I'm not a big fan of having to back it off like that because sometimes that means the nut is sort of loose. You can use Loctite or make sure that the nylon ring inside there is at least on the axle or flip it over so that the nylon ring goes on first and that'll help hold it on. But another thing that I like to do a lot is I will take this hex, and I do this on even the stock SCX, and I will sand this down. See this little lip here, or nipple? You sand it down so that the axle pin actually sits inside here and is hitting on the back of the hex, right? So it's when you tighten it down, it will sit on the hex completely. Now, you don't want to take off too much. If you take off too much and you basically take this nipple all the way off, uh, and you have too much space in here, you'll end up with some play, right? Like a lot of play in here, and you don't want a ton of play in there. This may be tight onto the uh, axle pin, but you'll have a lot of play in here, and just the axle in general, and that can cause your axle to bend or break and uh, just be sloppy. So you don't want to take off too much. You kind of want to test fit, sand it down a little, or dremel it down a little, and then test fit it. And once you get real close and you sand it, and test fit and test fit and test fit until it's basically you're able to tighten it all the way down and have just the smallest amount of play in your axle essentially this axle shaft should move just a tiny bit i don't know if you can see it but it should move like that you know just the tiniest bit with the wheel tightened all the way down but then that means you can have your nut tight against your wheel and your wheel against your hex and your hex against your axle shaft and it's super tight to your axle which is very good or just back off your nut okay you can see here just how much i took off for this particular situation sometimes it's going to be a little different it just depends on your axles your wheels and tires you know, some axle manufacturers are slightly different. Hex, the hex itself, how far they milled down on the inside for the uh, axle pin to sit in, a lot of variables. So you just gotta, it's gonna depend on you and your application. That's why it's so important to test fit and then take off a little more and test fit and take off a little more and just be patient. So we just barely took off a little bit and now we're able to uh, get it all the way down, down onto the axle shaft and axle shaft pin. And you can see I'm holding it super tight. You can see we've got just a tiny bit of play and I'm pushing down on this hex onto the pin pretty tight. We've got just a little bit of play there. Another thing that's nice that that does is it gives you more shaft. So your nut will have more room to tighten down onto because uh, your wheel sits in a little further. It does move your wheel in just that little, every amount you take off moves your wheel in a little bit and tire, but that's okay. We've already got the plus four, so. All right, let's finish it up. Well, we're back again. Before we get this done, we've noticed that the wheel is actually pressing against the paddy weight. So these bolts on the back of the wheel press against the paddy weight and that causes the paddy weight to push against the knuckle which is causing binding so again every set of parts is going to be different so you always just kind of test and test and test especially as you're putting it together so we're going to flip this paddy weight over if it was still doing that we might have to switch wheels or dremel down our paddy weight uh, sand it down so that it's just a little thinner and doesn't bind up as much this should totally fix it though let's see here Like I said, the goal is to be able to tighten this down pretty much all the way and still have, yep, there we go. Look at that, with no play in there, but it's still, look how loose that is. That means we have no binding, right? And then there's like, you can see there's, there's no play in there. Well, just a tad, just that little bit. That's exactly what we're looking for. Perfect. All right, let's get the rest done. 
a few moments later. All right, look at that. That's awesome looking. Well, these aren't the probably the best compound for crawling, but they're definitely squishy. They got a little stickiness. We'll see how it works. Again, we may end up changing the t wheels and tires at some point, but I just think this looks awesome. Look at that guy. Sitting at about, like I said, half droop. It's going to be a fun little, fun little rig for sure. One of the things I do wish about this kit is that there was a little bit more room for the motor and you could fit more uh, motor in there. You could put like a brushless in there if you really wanted to, you know, something like this guy. Um, but you're going to not have your interior. And one of the things that makes this thing so cool is the interior, right? Like the scale of it is just awesome. And just so you guys know, this is a real rig. Like the Apex One is a real life rock crawler, rock bouncer. Uh, we need to get our panels cut out and thrown on here. I don't know what we're doing with that yet, um, but we will get that done before we drive it. So well, let's work on that next. Very cool. So included with the kit is this Lexan panel and it is clear. It's just got two sides of uh, protectant on it, right? So that you can protect the Lexan uh, when you paint it or cut it. What we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna take this template sticker essentially and we're going to peel it off and we're going to throw it on here and then we're going to exacto and just score at it now you're going to want to make sure you have a fairly new or at least or you know brand new even blade to do this um you can try using these guys i think this is a uh it's called a number 10 the, the rounded blades those work well but we're just going to just use a standard i think and when we score this definitely want to try to score it on the outside of the lines because again if you cut in too far you can't add right if you if you end up cutting in too far or you make a mistake and you kind of cut in or something slips there's no adding back right so we're going to cut right to the outside of the line and then we can always go back in and trim it back up and just take your time with scoring it and once you've got it decently scored you can kind of just work at it by bending a little bit and then it'll eventually snap right where you cut If it doesn't feel like it's it's weak enough or you know moving much on your line just go ahead and score it just a little bit more and again just be patient it's about going slow just give it a couple little slices you don't have to push real hard just a little bit also don't forget your back has protectant on it so go ahead and cut that out you can score along that as well just so that uh, as you cut it out it'll, it'll slide out okay all right bam got everything all cut out and this is just backing here and um, we're gonna go ahead and drill our holes while our template's still on there and then I think I'm gonna go ahead and score just a little bit here so that we can try to bend these I don't know the best way to bend these uh, I think it's just a little bit of scoring and then bend it but don't bend it until it breaks right so let's get our holes drilled and then once that's all drilled we can actually test fit everything see how, see how it fits and then we can trim more because again we left quite a bit on the edges so we can kind of reshape things and make them a little bit more accurate or cleaner now to get our bend we did one light light score you may not even need to i don't really I haven't done a lot with lexan especially thick lexan like this but then we took pliers make sure you've got your protective coating on there still and we just kind of took it like so and bent it along the line get the pliers close as close as you can and then just give it a little bend slowly and just keep bending it and eventually you'll be able to form it into the bend you need and then that will fit the curvature of the chassis. Now we drilled our holes exactly where the template showed. You can see on these guys, we've got holes exactly on the template, but for some reason on this guy, they're off. You can see the holes are slightly above, the holes in the chassis are slightly above the template holes. So just be aware of that maybe don't drill your holes until you've got it put onto your chassis and then use your chassis holes to be your guides and just drill straight through the chassis 
and then into the Lexan. That way you've got an exact match. Because that kind of sucks. That's unfortunate. Again, follow the holes exactly where they were. I don't know about these ones or the roof yet, so we'll see. Now, it's not too, too far off, so I think I'm just going to open up these holes and bring them down a little bit, just a little, and then bring these holes up just a little bit. I'm not going to drill new holes. I'll just basically kind of ream it out going this way. Sorry, this way and this way. And it should be able to fit, hopefully. And that worked out well. It didn't take much, just a little bit of adjustment. Like I said, build it out a little to the top, a little to the bottom, and everything seems to go on well. I think we're going to leave these clear. It's kind of cool. I kind of like the clear panels. Could be fun. All right, we're going to finish this up, and then we'll show you. All right, we've got the roof and the hood on. And now we're going to do the side panels. These side panels definitely have a tight fit when it comes to uh, fitting up into between the, the tube chassis, essentially. So you're going to want to, if you've already drilled your holes, you're going to definitely want to try to see where your holes need to align so that you can trim accordingly on the outside. And we're probably just going to use some sandpaper and we're just going to flat sand it until this piece fits up in here and down on the bottom there. It's just a little off because again, we overcut the size just a tad. Um, so now we can just trim it down and make sure that all of our holes are aligning, aligning properly. And there it is. Got all our like sand panels on sides, roof, and the hood. You can see we've got our scores and bends. You gotta be careful when you score these. Don't score very deep and slow, I mean, just, just a line basically, and then slowly bend them. If you cut them too deep or you bend them too fast, they'll break, so just be very careful. Um, but it does come out very good. Yeah, all of our suspension feels great. This rig is dialed. Well, I mean, not dialed, because we can adjust it based on uh, what we're gonna be crawling or doing, but it's it definitely, once you get the shocks figured out, it's smooth. It does well. I mean, you can see that. We're going to run on some rocks here in a little bit. Just wanted to show you show you the deal. We got our battery. We're using the FMS battery. So that's pretty sweet. And we're actually able to pop the battery out as well. So I can just pull off this little battery strap. I usually like hook it around the shock here. So it doesn't get sucked down underneath, right? And I can just pull the battery out and tuck it back in. And then I can tuck in the wires here on the sides pretty slick and it's all tucked in underneath which is nice if you didn't use clear panels that would definitely be hiding even more so um, the hood is definitely nice to be able to hide that stuff and I dig the, the driver for sure the driver's awesome you know I was showing somebody in there and asking why does the driver sit off to the side he's like he sits in the middle almost to this side but his steering wheel is on this side question mark Maybe that's how the real Apex one is. Here's uh, some pictures of the Apex One Experimental Class in, in Europe. It's a European build. It's a pretty cool looking rig. Uh, definitely small, so it makes sense why this cage is so small. Um, we're running much bigger tires than they would run in that. And again, these are like kind of monster trucky tires, um, but we'll see how they crawl. Pretty wide. Um, it looks cool. We're kind of about having some cool looking stuff here. All right, we're gonna go ahead and run it. But I really love that the uh, FCX battery fits right in there. Everything's hidden, it's nice and clean. Uh, all hidden underneath the driver, it's pretty slick. But that does mean you're limited in your electronics. You need to make sure that you've got, you know, proper electronics for this build. You're not gonna be able to jam large receivers in there, or large ESCs, or obviously the motor, right? You need to stick with a small motor. Uh, probably can't run an outrunner in here at all, unless you were to not run the interior. If you don't run the interior, then you know you kind of the sky's the limit in what you throw in there. But really, this build's about looking clean. You really want it to look clean. So don't forget we've got our uh, overdrive transmission, so we're gonna have a little bit of overdrive in the front or underdrive in the rear, however you want to look at it. And uh, should be pretty pretty slick. Let's get it up on some rocks and show you uh, show you it crawling a little bit. We'll wrap it up.
Alrighty guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. This little thing's awesome. It's a blast to drive. Uh, it's just cool kind of seeing it articulate over the rocks and flex. And uh, it's got good travel. And I think, you know, with some true rock crawling tires, this thing would just kill lines. Um, the center of gravity is real low. We're pretty forward biased, the weight in the front. Um, rear steering is always fun. And uh, forward mounted battery, low LCG, just it's killing it. It also seems really strong. You know, we took a few little tumbles and uh, no issues. So uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Definitely check out Dinky RC. We'll put links down in the comments below. And uh, yeah, definitely check it out. I think it's worth it if you uh, are looking for something different and you're definitely looking for like a builder's kit and you like the challenge of trying to keep all the electronics nice and clean and tight in there. It's definitely worth it. It's a, it's a fun build for sure. It's quality, all the prints quality. Uh, he knocked it out of the park with this for sure. I think he did a good job. So definitely check it out. Um, why don't you put down in the comments below experimental class put that down in the comments below let us know you watched the whole video and uh yeah make sure you like subscribe share hit that notification bell do all those things you do at the end of a video subscribing is just a click for you but it means the world to us and uh it helps get people like dinky more exposure the more you know subs we get the more people viewing these videos gets these smaller manufacturers more recognition and uh helps people keep innovating in the space you know people like this that are actually designing new stuff versus just rehashing the old this is this is a unique chassis for sure uh, there's a lot of rock bouncer chassis but none that are the shorty you know real tight uh and real scale basically looking chassis so definitely uh respectable so be sure to check them out they've got a ton of other awesome stuff so um oh they also have a big one check this out that's a big uh tent scale guy so if you're into that kind of stuff check that out too all right guys until next time get out there build something awesome smash them crash them and bash them don't break the expensive parts mm -hmm.